Welcome to Breathe California TV. My name is Terry Trumbull. I'm a volunteer for Breathe California here in the South Bay. Each week we try to pre uh, present a program for you on uh, preventing damage to your lungs. One of the most significant uh, people in helping that happen is Councilman Don Roca from San Jose. We're going to talk with him about um, programs the city's done to both improve your health and make a better environment. See you in 30 seconds. Now, nice thing about Better Breathers Club is we go in and there's other people sitting around with oxygen. It, it's, it's almost a, a relief that everybody looks the same in the room. It's a funny thing to say, but uh, it, it's, a, it's a good feeling. Brief California means having resources available to us that will help guide us and make our lives easier. Welcome back to Breathe California TV. Uh, I'm the chair of our prevention committee, so we focus on uh, stopping your lungs from being damaged, uh, either through preventing smoking, controlling smoking, or air pollution are two dominant areas. But most of our resources are spent on helping people with breathing difficulties, like you saw in the uh, asthma camp. Last year, we helped 150,000 people in this county with breathing difficulties. But fortunately, today we get to focus on prevention. So I'm with Councilman Don Rocha from San Jose. Welcome. Thank you for having me, Terry. So uh, what area of San Jose do you represent? It's identified as the District 9 area, uh, oftentimes called Cambrian. Some of the boundaries not formal is generally Bascom, Blossom Hill, Almaden Expressway, up Kirtner. Again, that's not a perfect example, but that's the general area. So you've been on council four years. You got some things you uh, feel good about? Yeah, I, I love the work and I love the policy work. Public service is something I've been doing for a long time and um, I don't see myself doing anything else. So off air we were talking about the uh, wonderful, relatively new for cities, controls that you put on smoking in parks. What's that all about? Oh, that, um, I, that, was, that was really good work. But as, again, you mentioned us just talking offline a little bit, I, I put a lot of credit on the advocacy groups, I mean, Breathe California and some of the nonprofits that have really promoted some of these policies and approached cities about adopting these. Really, they're the heroes in this. Um, yes, we do the work at the back end and adopt these policies, and in some cases it may be a difficult vote. Um, but at the end of the day, this is all good stuff, and really the, the credit goes to a lot of other folks outside City Hall. So how in the world are you going to get elected being this modest? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, well <laughs> great question. Yeah, really I don't have an answer for that really, one. Really Stump me matter. already. But I mean, that does tell, you, tell our listeners a lot about the process. Um, yesterday I spoke at a local high school and in my speech saying, you make a difference. Go out and participate. You'll be astounded at how responsive the world is. Is that uh, fit for what your view of things is? Yeah, it is. Um, you could say that in some cases if a policy gets to the council that it's already a done deal, and folks have used that phrase quite often. Um, and in some cases may be true, but in often cases that's not always true, and especially on the front end. If it gets to the council in that form, the work on the front end is so critical, and that's why getting involved, like you just talked about, uh, is really important. So the front end might be anybody who's listening to us just going in and making an appointment at your office and bringing up a, a problem. Yeah, leaf blowers is a perfect example. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of folks in the in the district uh, in San Jose that approached the office and met with myself and another council member and talked about the pollution coming from um, the gas blowers and talked about using electrical ones and lo and behold council member Colorado I think is pursuing that and that just came from a resident saying, you know what, I'm, the noise and, and the pollution, I'm tired of it, do something. So, yeah, it's, it can work. Yeah, and those things make a uh, big difference, you know, either uh, reducing noise in your neighborhood, which impacts mental attitudes, mm -hmm. uh, cuts down on road rage, and then you have a whole <laughs> bunch of neighbor yes. problems just by having less noise as well as the obvious pollution problems makes a difference. Well. Uh, your council adopted a brand new general plan. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that, and are you happy with it, uh, unhappy with it? Well, I think it was a paradigm shift, mm -hmm. and with paradigm shifts, um, there's a little bit of uncomfortableness that often accompanies that. Uh, 
starting something out of the gate and suggesting where we focus our development, you know, pulling back urban sprawl, urban village concept, um, moving some of the, the density of housing downtown and North San Jose near our employment centers, all good things. So I, I think is a paradigm shift. Now the hard part is getting the developers and the property owners, the, one who, the folks who own the property or the ones who have to invest in it, to buy into it. And that means that elected officials and planning staff have to hold the line on some of these planning principles and, and stick to them. And that's going to be where the real work comes. Yes, that process took a lot of time to adopt that general plan, and a lot of uh, community folks put some work into it. Um, but again, there's still work to be done, and that's just simply holding the line on some of these planning principles. Yeah, and it's real tough when you have developers who may have put a lot of money into developing some place that is sprawl, and you guys are trying to rein that in. Yeah, we the focus on um, doing development and housing around, tr and even jobs around transit lines, uh, such as bus, uh, light rail, the new BART station, um, and then again, the downtown core, we want to create that urban environment. So yeah, there's some folks who might have some properties in other areas that are also looking for conversions in employment areas. And yeah, they have spent a lot of money and they're going to make a strong case that we should be doing other types of development than probably the city wants to see. But again, it's holding that line is the hard part. So uh, you mentioned urban village. Uh, I'm not entirely sure I know what it is, so I suspect some of our audience doesn't. What, what is it? Well. Given that we haven't done one yet, you could yeah. say that we don't know either in the city of yeah. San Jose. Right now we're working on that. So we're trying to define what an urban village would look like. We have the concepts around it. Consultants have done some kind of layouts to show us what it is. It's the density levels that we're still trying to work through. And the other side of that is also the financing around it. We've got to make sure that it pencils for a property owner. Otherwise, we can put it on a pretty piece of paper and they're not going to invest in that site. So the urban villages are set up, as I mentioned, around um, bus lines, uh, light rail lines, BART, and in the downtown core. And they're a corridor, so to speak, where we're going to intensify development and try and place some jobs near housing and then also some retail. So you're trying to create an environment where folks can walk and to walk to work, walk to dinner, walk to lunch, and walk to their house. So it, it's again going to be a long process as was a general plan 2040 so it's not going to happen overnight um, but it's exciting stuff so uh, terry christensen a retired poli sci professor was on this show a couple of months ago talking about the neighborhood working cooperatively with all sorts of groups for uh, one of these urban villages not in your district roughly where uh, santa clara hits 101 mm -hmm. um, is that kind of going to be a model? It's where the BART station is. Um, does the things they're doing there work as a model for other areas? Yeah, that one, there's another one in Mountain View, and I think Cupertino have done some on a smaller scale. The Hitachi development out in South San Jose is one that we're looking at as somewhat of a model. But again, right now we're going through the process. The, some of the struggles that I've had with it, which I didn't allude to, was the, the level of density that we're talking about in some of these cases. And, and you may have residential units around them. And I don't know if every resident in San Jose paid attention to the general plan update. And I don't know if every you, resident... You don't think all <laughs> 1, 1 million 50,000 or whatever they are no. paid attention? No, I don't think they're watching that council meeting. So they might, may not know what level of density that the city is considering for a property that might be pretty darn close to their house. So the work not only is holding the line, working with the development community, it's going to be working with the existing residents that are around these areas as well. Yeah, that's imperative. I, for me, it's easy to point to. My um, city had a special, I live in Palo Alto, and there was a very modest increase in development on El Camino, which is the high uh, transit street in, the, in uh, the city other than the Caltrain. And boy, they got no neighborhood, made no attempt to talk to the neighborhood, and were blown out of the water and lost like 55, 45 on a referendum. It doesn't do you any good to have a great plan if you haven't got the neighborhood with you. Yeah, there, just coincidentally, I think it was two nights ago that we had a community meeting in my district around an urban village property, the uh, Cambrian Park Plaza at the corner of uh, Union and Camden. And um, the property owner put it up for sale and it's in an urban village and the, say, the property has not been sold. The developer has not submitted any plans, but I had an interest in getting in front of the issue and because we got a lot of calls from the residents asking what's going to happen with it, what's going to happen with it. And we went out there and told them, well, at this point, nothing's happening with it. But it is in, in an urban village area. And just so you know, this is what 
the development could look like. And of course, you had a lot of folks saying that density is really off the charts. And you had a lot of folks saying, well, it'd be nice to have a, a here, here's, well, what's they call it, a, a there, there, so to speak, for mm -hmm. Cambrian. Um, so you had a lot of mixed messages. But again, I think it was valuable for the planning staff that were there to see the type of feedback they can expect as we start going down this path. Well, it's a rare councilman that would create controversy. <laughs> But that is absolutely the best thing you can do rather than having the developers spend millions and then discover the community doesn't like it. Great point. There was actually one of the folks who submitted a bid. I think there was a lot of bids. But there's one developer who at the end introduced himself. I think he waited to the end because he's a little nervous yeah. and said that he put a bid in and said he was very happy that he showed up to hear the feedback. So I, I think you only get better outcomes by engaging the public and the community, truly. Well, off air, you met one of my uh, students, and we're doing a pretend mediation in his environmental law class today. And one of the reasons I have them doing is do it is to understand that development doesn't need to be hostile with a developer. Yeah. And pejoratively, they call NIMBYs being the people in the area. That the best thing a developer can do is get out and start talking to people. Well, well put. That's yeah. a great point. I, I believe in it wholeheartedly. It, it may be painful on the front end, um, but the closer you get to the process playing out, uh, everybody's going to understand points of views a lot better for having the conversation. So uh, you already raised one of the issues that I would think your district has. Unlike most of the city, you don't really have an urban core center the way you, you would in downtown San Jose or Willa Glen might have. Um, can you create that with the uh, urban village or two or three or four? You could uh, uh, to a certain level. I, I believe you can. And my, as you pointed out, my district is a little bit different than a lot of the other ones in the sense that it's truly suburbia. Yeah. There's no really job employment center. There's no downtown area. Um, it is suburbia at its best. So um, that would be a little bit of a paradigm shift, using that phrase again for some sure. of the residents in my district, because they're they probably moved to suburbia to be in suburbia. So to bring urban living to them might not be as well received, at least immediately. Yeah, and I understand that. And yet over the long term, I don't know that our use of cars is as sustainable as we might like 20 years from now. But uh, most people are far more focused on where they are right now than, than that. Um, so we're uh, about halfway through the show. We're going to take a break and hear another message from Breed, California, and then we'll be back with Councilman Don Rocha. I have asthma, and so asthma, like, I can't do that many sports because I, like, wheeze and then I have to take my inhaler. I, I can't do a lot of things other kids can do. What I learned at Asthma Camp is how to treat your asthma and, like, don't don't hold back if you have asthma. Brief California has made it easier for me to play sports and do other things that I couldn't do before. Welcome back. This is Brief California TV. My name is Terry Trumbull. I'm with San Jose Councilman Don Rocha. So uh, one of the things that strikes me about the new general plan is its focus on uh, alternative forms of transportation making it easier for people to bike and walk. Yeah, that's, uh, again, overplaying the word paradigm shift. We're trying to force the issue uh, in many different ways, creating bike lanes where there isn't, um, bigger sidewalks to encourage pedestrian use, uh, trying to eliminate some of those large setbacks and bring the development up to the front so pedestrians feel a little bit more comfortable walking down and just don't have open space like you sometimes see in, in North San Jose especially. It isn't just San Jose, but the paradigm, I think, you're talking about shifting from is virtually every land use plan in the state before say 2000 said the only way to get around is a car. Um, so um, we're seeing downtown San Jose lane changes. Uh, yeah. uh, are they um, throughout the city or is it just more of a focus on downtown areas where I happen to be all the time? Yeah, we're starting in downtown. Uh, more looking at other areas of the city, uh, bike pathways we're talking about, but I think mm -hmm. a, another critical part of this is the work on trails and finishing our trail system to not just for pedestrians to walk and just have 
a nice place to, to get outside. But the other part is the, the biking. So folks have a way to work and they don't have to ride on the streets where we may not have a complete network of bike lanes. So that's another component that I think really we should be focusing a little bit more of our attention on. As I can't tell you how often folks in my district, again, suburbia, um, talk about opportunities to ride their bikes and there just isn't because we've got mainly just thoroughfares of folks commuting. Um, any significant creeks because a number of areas in the city have converted those into trails and bikeways as well. Yeah, we've got plans on the books for pretty much all of them. There is one that shoots out um, along Highway 87 that we're discussing, which might be a new opportunity. Uh, the water district's going to have to be a partner in that quite often. And they've been good. They've gotten a lot better over the years, and I think they're a lot more proactive around that. So um, they've been great partners on this. Yeah, I sit on the uh, oversight committee for the uh, tax expenditures that we voted on in 2000, mm -hmm. 2012, and at least compared to our goals, what we promised the voters would happen, the trails along bikeways have really proceeded well. And that's really a compliment to the cities. Nothing happens with that money. The water district will make its uh, stream, be stream beds, stream beds is right, banks, mm -hmm available but it's up to cities to petition and then the water district allocates money for doing that yeah um so um anything else on smoking that you can think of besides smoking in parks have you guys done any other controls you can think of oh the high density um the common areas around that yeah. that was another effort again probably uh, initiated from some advocacy groups, and I think Council Member Kalra, again, probably was the leader on the council, at least initially, to get that through. That was uh, a great move. Um, secondhand smoke, you know, some folks may show some studies about the impact. It's not just immediate standing next to somebody. Uh, the travel of the smoke can also impact folks, and then in high-density housing, it can go through the vents, it can go through the ceiling, it's stuck in the carpet, trickles out the windows, goes to the neighbor, so the impact was significant. So. You know, some of those issues, there's still work to be done, don't get me wrong. And uh, I think um, the City of San Jose will probably be a leader again on a number of these issues, but that was a great effort of, on our part, and we well, glad we did it. Every time that you guys take it up, it serves the biggest single benefit is education. Yeah. Um, 1988 or so, we had 25% smoking, and we're down to 8% of adults smoking now. That's, uh, I think we're the second best county in the the state, don't ask me who's first, but that rate of smoking is really an immense improvement for everybody, not just the, the smokers. Yeah, and then now we have this issue with our youth and these e-cigarettes and the vapors. I mean, I don't even, those are new to me, so that might be another path that you'll see the city of San Jose way down. I think we've got a referral to staff to, to look at the issue because we've had some residents, mainly parents, talking about their kids potentially using it and seeing it in the high schools or with high school kids. So there's another frontier that we're going to probably have to wade down and, and see what we can do. Uh, again, it's, like I said, our work is not done. Yeah, there's state legislation. On, you know, I don't even know where the name e-cigarettes come from. It certainly has nothing to do with electronics, but maybe that makes it sound jazzier. It's just yeah. something that releases vapor. Mm -hmm. um, but they're every bit as bad as cigarettes, and, but nobody's very prepared for it. No. There's a bill in the legislature that I think will significantly regulate them and put warnings on them like regular cigarettes, but it's going to take councils like yours to uh, adopt steps above and beyond that. Um, you know, things like sales. Yeah. Um, Mayor Gonzalez and I held a press conference where the police uh, did a special effort just to try to catch uh, tobacco sellers that were selling to minors on a regular basis and uh, that was a very nice program the city had just to slow down the retailers doing it illegally and we may need to do something like that on e-cigarette. I do recall that. that was a very successful effort I mean I think you're right I mean that's mm -hmm. probably in our future and we could be dealing with that around medicinal marijuana collectives as well too I mean it just our work never ends. Yeah, well, you mentioned that. You were up till 11.30 or something last night on medicinal marijuana. And I gather you don't even have regulatory authority on what's in those cigarettes. It's just, um, you know, in, in medical marijuana, you just decide whether you want to have 
programs and clinics? Do you have, how much discretion do you have? Well, our authority really is in the land use, so okay. we could ban them just outright that they're not allowed to locate in San Jose. Um, but given the level of support for the Compassionate Use Act, we felt compelled to not follow the path of other cities who banned them and try and create an environment where we could have some collectives. Uh, unfortunately, the proliferation got out of hand and we're playing catch up right now, so it's a difficult issue. Um, but I think we're gonna make some headway. We will be taking the final action uh, next Tuesday, the May 20th. Yeah, I don't think there's any um, doubt that there's legitimate uses for it, but outside of your domain is that uh, you watch films like Botany of Desire, which was a book before, and with the contents not being regulated, it's far more severe lung impact than uh, cigarettes are yeah. on people. Just, you know, the Food and Drug Administration doesn't regulate it like they do cigarettes, but uh, that's pretty much outside of your control. Which is why we need help from the state and feds on this yeah. issue, and leaving it to cities to try and, and manage this and establish regulations is really, in my opinion, a failure at the state and federal level. So we always talk about those folks stepping up and helping us and reach out and ask, and um, action has been slow to come. If any. Yes. Um, I'm kind of aware of this. You may not know, my wife was a federal judge for 24 years, and their law still prohibits it. Yes. So, uh, you know, a federal uh, DEA agent can walk, stand outside the door of a medical marijuana facility and arrest everybody that comes out of it. I had that happen to a student. He went to uh, Yosemite for a national parks class and a ranger arrested him for smoking marijuana when he had a medical marijuana hmm. certificate because the feds can do it. So let's switch to uh, plastic bags. Uh, we're doing in my environmental law class an ocean segment hmm. next week and uh, I would think every one of them is very happy at what you guys have done. So. Tell our audience what the city did with plastic bags. That one actually happened before I got in office. So I came in after okay. the council adopted it. So I got to hear all of the residents' complaints and also the folks who were a little more progressive. Congratulations on it. I think it was a great thing the city of San Jose did. Um, we were seeing it, as I understand it. We all saw it. Waterways, you know, streets, gutters, and it was clogging up drains. So it was causing a significant environmental impact, in my opinion, and I think the, the, the research showed it. So when we adopted the ban, we established some process. I think we phased it in over a certain period, and it's been nothing but good for us. I mean, even the recyclers that were doing the garbage and the recycling for the city of San Jose were having those things tear up their machinery, so there was really no good outcome. Well, on top of that, we have the Regional Water Quality Control Board looking to us to reduce our litter, and that was another component that we can re reduce litter on. So it's been nothing but a good thing for San Jose in my opinion. Yeah, and uh, ultimately getting it, because they're on uh, the city's back over the streams yes. and creeks, but in the bay or out in the ocean is pretty dramatic. There are five enormous areas bigger than Texas in the oceans of the world where it's just plastics going around and around because they never disappear, but they do a great job of killing birds and, and fish, so nothing but um, praise for um, for that one. Do you see anything similar coming down in other types of um, plastics? Um, you well, know, we did our, from, yeah, we did yeah. our polystyrene ban as yeah. well. So those two efforts, and that one was done when I was on the council, and that was a good year and a half process. Uh, had to reach out to the stakeholders, uh, the businesses that were going to be impacted, and really do our work. And the community engagement, honestly, at the end of the day, was very valuable because by the time we got to that vote on the council, um, really the industry that was left really kind of fighting it didn't really concede it, but they did not throw down and, you know, challenge it. They did not do a ballot initiative, citizen initiative, and trying to overturn it. They just recognized that this is generally the way that uh, we're all going with the environment. So I think it was a good, another good outcome on San Jose's behalf. So uh, the Regional Water Quality Control Board, I praise them for it, but they've been doing some things that most people might not have thought was water pollution. One was the plastic bags. Mm -hmm. The other was that they're uh, threatening San Jose over activities of the homeless in the creeks. Any comments about the, that or where San Jose can go to fix this? Homeless has got to be the worst problem for any city to cope with. Well, the homeless issue, one's outside the scope of this, and two, I'm looking to punt because that's a 
if I had an answer to that, I'd be in a much higher office because that, that issue has been challenging San Jose and other communities for a long time, and I don't have any solution in front of me. As far as the Regional Water Quality Control Board and their interest in that, it really went back to the litter and the impact yeah. on the waterways. And they were getting on the city of San Jose, well-founded, for us to step up and clean up some of these sites. I mean, it wasn't about housing the homeless. It wasn't about the folks and what they were causing. It was the impact purely on the environment, and we needed to mitigate that. And um, so uh, I, not that I welcomed it with open arms, but I wasn't going to shy away from it. They were right to call us on it. Yeah, and it's clearly a significant problem for some areas of the, the city, you know, and yes. um, it's just one of those issues that you haven't talked to a lot of the council candidates. No one seems to have any good answers for because homeless is a far bigger problem than just a creek pollution one. Yeah, well put. It's about housing and finding affordable housing in this in this region, in this part of the country. That's our biggest challenge. So. Um, working on the ho homeless issue is really truly working about affordable housing. Well, and they can probably get away with it, but my city's actually uh, petitioning or trying to work with groups to change Prop 13 to encourage more housing by restructuring the way it's taxed because it clearly uh, causes city money to lo cities lose money if they allow housing to be built. So it's a real um, tough issue to, to cope with. That one and CEQA reform at the state level, those two issues I think would be um, huge movements for California and where, wherever those issues go, uh, I just think we should be talking about it and we should be nudging our elected officials at the state level to, to find some action. And I'm not going to define what it should look like, um, but they need to move on it because I think there's some, there's some opportunities for, for California to be in a better well, place. Yeah, and expand a little bit more on uh, CEQA, for audience, this is the California Environmental Quality Act. And any uh, government, local, special district like the water district or the state needs to evaluate environmental impacts before making a decision. And there's a lot of push to change that. So what's your experience with the city? What kind of problems would you say um, the law has been creating? You know, I, don't, I have a different view of it, and I'm generally pretty pro-development, um, but I don't think CEQA has really been a, a major problem. Uh, could it use some, I guess you can use reform, I, I'd rather use the word modification. Sure, I mean any legislation that's a decade, 20, 30, 40 years old, um, times change, uh, land use principles change, and we should take a look at maybe some modifications around it. It has been used in some forms that was not its intent. But, you know, that, as any law, has happened <laughs> across the board, so I'm not going to hold that purely on CEQA's back. So I, I think we should be looking at some modification. So I'm, uh, in general, pretty much in agreement with you. I, you know, my sense is that uh, the problems are more with developers not talking to the residents or not addressing the concerns, mm -hmm. because it's rarely the environmental impact report itself that presents a problem. It's that people don't want the development, period. Um, but I probably uh, didn't help myself. I was interviewed for an environmental job with the governor uh, about three years ago, and they asked me what I thought, and I said that. And the governor clearly had some bad experiences with Oakland, mm -hmm. where he's not quite as level, let's put it that way, as yeah. you and I are on the issue. So I think we will see some changes. So whatever, uh, what else in... Um, San Jose in terms of environmental or resource issues should we be uh, talking about? You know, I, we covered a lot of the main issues that we've been working on, uh, our green building efforts um, around uh, new development and how buildings are being built and homes are being built and trying to be environmentally conscious, I think, is a new frontier for us and a frontier for many communities. And I think that's some opportunity for everybody to work together on. I think that's a great wrap up because we're out of time. So thanks for watching Breathe California TV, and we'll see you again next week. Mm -hmm.